So why don't we get started? Um, it's a beautiful day in Minneapolis, and uh, maybe that's why no one came in person. <laughs> but I'm glad that you all are here uh, online. And um, yeah, welcome. Um, for those of you who might be new, this is a group that I've been running uh, since January. And it's a drop-in group on this uh, topic of the paramis, which is a list of 10 virtues in the Buddhist tradition. Um, so we usually start with a half hour or so guided meditation, and then I'll give a talk, and then we'll have time for discussion. So that's the plan. So we can just settle in now for our guided meditation. Just arriving here and now. Feeling the body. However, the body is in this moment. However, the mind is making space, the space of non-resistance, non-contention with the way it is right now. It is this way. The mind and body are this way right now. Can we make space for it to be known fully here and now? We could think of this as a coming home, coming home to our present moment experience. Connecting with the body on its own terms, not our ideas about the body, our opinions about the body, but getting to the level of pressure and tension and relaxation and space and contraction, or however we might experience what we call embodiment, the physical body, and also the inner body, the energetic body, sense of tiredness or alertness, maybe different sensations, different energy movements that we sense in different parts of the body. So all of this, we can include in our awareness. And we're not expecting it to be any way We're showing up to meet it as it is right now. And we can only know how it is by being mindful, being present, being aware, 
being interested. Doesn't mean we have to like it, prefer it. We don't need to have an opinion about it. Pleasant, unpleasant feeling in the body, in the mind. It's just nature coming and going. And if we notice reactivity in the mind, not liking, liking, or not being aware, being deluded, not knowing what's happening, greed, aversion, delusion, if we notice these attitudes in the mind, it's not a problem. We just want to know how the mind is relating. There's no rushing. No leaning forward into the next moment. No trying to hold on to a moment that's already passed. There isn't even a clinging to ideas about the present, the present moment. Simply remembering to recognize the present moment's experience. Oh, it's like this now. Body feels like this. Mind, heart feel like this. This is being known here and now. It's the nature of the body and mind. So simply allowing the nature of the body and mind to unfold. and seeing if it's possible to sustain an interest moment by moment in this nature of the body and mind unfolding and in our capacity to be aware in a peaceful, relaxed way. So 
So let's continue in silence.
from time to time we can check in, maybe ask a question, is the mind aware or is it lost in thought? And just asking that question tends to bring the mind back to awareness. And then the invitation is to sustain, not sustain any particular experience, but just to sustain that interest and willingness to be interested in the unfolding of present moment experience. Settling back, relaxing, relaxing the body, relaxing the mind. Making space for whatever's moving to move in the body and mind. And knowing that it can be known in the space of awareness. Noticing any flavor of P 
peace. A peaceful relationship with the changing conditions. Even if it's a subtle peace, not the most obvious experience, but some sort of peaceful, non-combative, wise way of relating where we're making space for what's being known to be known, to move, to change, to express its nature. And by noticing any flavor of peace, this will allow us to experience that more fully, to allow that peace to be known more fully throughout the body and mind. The peace of non-contention, peace of making space for everything to come and go, to arise and pass in the space of awareness. And for the last minute of the meditation, if your eyes have been closed, you might want to practice with your eyes open, gazing gently in front of you, letting go of directing the mind to any particular experience, simply sitting right in the middle of our experience not resisting, not leaning forward. We could say patient with things as they are, things as they're expressing themselves. So we can take a few seconds, a minute, if people want to stand and stretch.
So thanks for being here. Um, for those who, who might be new, like I said at, at the beginning of the meditation, this is a twice a month group on the paramis, a list of 10 virtues in Theravada Buddhism. And um, it's a drop-in group, so really happy that you all dropped in tonight. And yeah, we've been moving through this list since January, and we're now on number six out of 10, which is patience. And yeah, it's been a really, for me, really enjoyable um, couple of months going through this list. And if you haven't studied this list before, um, I really recommend it, you know, looking at it, uh, the whole um, 10 qualities. And um, there's these list, these cards that you can um, access online that Ajahn Suchitto, who is a Buddhist monk from England, he has these cards and um, you could print them out if you wanted. I'm not sure if they have physical copies that you could request, you, you could try. Um, I have a physical copy. I was lucky enough to get a copy um, at a retreat with him once. And each of them has a little description of one of the 10 paramis and you can sort of use them when you need some guidance in daily life, um, just coming against some challenge in life and wanting to remember uh, some of your values, some Buddhist values to help orient you. And that's how I think of these 10 qualities is really, um, really useful in really useful reminders to sort of um, give us a perspective that's maybe bigger than a habitual, maybe knee jerk, more self-centered reaction that we can have just in, yeah, in daily life and in looking at, um, yeah, just the everyday challenges that come up. And so these, these virtues are really meant, I think, to kind of stretch our imagination. And I think some people might, um, we can be turned off by even the word virtue, you know, because we can think it, it's about being perfect or we have to be um, saintly or something and and then we can just use them as you know excuses to feel bad about ourselves that we're not you know meeting that criteria or something but I think it's a it's a use of imagination and creativity just to consider how these parmi these virtues consider their perspective, um, like metta, for instance, goodwill, which is, we'll cover in a couple, probably a month or so. Um, you know, goodwill obviously is something that hopefully we're all familiar with to some degree and we have experienced directed towards us and we, we experience directing it outwards um, or feeling it in moments for others. And then the question is, what does goodwill look like in the moments where we feel justified in having ill will? Um, so with all these parami, there's sort of the different stages. The first is just sort of considering it, you know, kind of wrapping our head around it conceptually. Well, what, what does this mean, goodwill? You know, how is it different from just being sentimental or uh, attached love and affection? You know, so kind of just thinking about it, getting clear. And then the second is sort of applying it, so actually bringing it to bear in our life. And usually in situations where its opposite is being triggered. So like today we'll cover patience. So really the best time to learn about patience is when we're experiencing impatience, experiencing rushing, wanting things our way, wanting to kind of cut corners, uh, wanting to kind of force our way through a situation, use our willpower to try to make things um, yeah, go our way. And then in bringing patience to that or bringing goodwill to a situation where we're feeling ill will, then there's kind of this kind of, um, it's kind of a, a fiery um, or Joko Beck, a Zen teacher talks about sitting on the icy couch. So there's this kind of 
purification, you could say, where precisely we're bringing up a parami that gives us a different perspective than our habitual perspective, and we're sort of testing it out. You know, is this actually skillful? And that's always the question, and I think that's an important point when talking about these qualities, because we can think that it's just something that we should do, or, you know, in order to be a good Buddhist, you have to be kind all the time. And, but the question really is, is it skillful? And skillful means, is it leading to our and others' long-term uh, welfare? Is it for our and others' welfare? So it's a very practical uh, definition of what's skillful. And then the idea is, um, so that first step is just to consider it. Second step is to apply it and see what effect it has. And then the third is where it's, uh, the mind is recognizing, oh yeah, it's aligning and there's some resonance. Yes, like this is, I trust this. This is uh, a trustworthy intention in the mind, a trustworthy perspective that I can call upon in my life um, that can is it you know in times where there's confusion and difficulty I can remember that the heart has this capacity to sort of be wide be bigger in a way um, than maybe its habit is and to cross over the floods of suffering which is a, a metaphor that the Buddha often used uh, of crossing floods and Ajahn Suchitta uses it in his book um, on the parami. And the floods, there's four of them, which I talked about on the very first um, session in January. But basically, they're all the ways that we get flooded, you know, that experience of being flooded, being overwhelmed, and also the, all the ways that the mind floods out and sort of gets caught up in obsession and, um, yeah views and attachments. So these parami are ways to cross the floods, ways not to repress our suffering or our attachments, but it's like we need information. Um, in Buddhism, in, in the suttas, there's a, a phrase, the voice of another. We're really dependent on the voice of another. As deluded beings, we have, you know, we're not blank slates. We're sort of coming in with a lot of conditioning, family conditioning, societal conditioning, biological conditioning. So we're kind of, we're wired for, you know, basically greed, aversion, and delusion. Not that we don't have other wholesome qualities wired as well, but, um, but they, it's just, it's not even in Buddhism, in, in early Buddhism, it's not, really considered even that there's kind of a primordial pureness or anything. There's just conditions that lead to other conditions. And the freedom that we're interested in, which in early Buddhism is a freedom, a happiness that's not dependent on conditions, that kind of freedom does arise conditionally because we need to create the conditions that support that sort of understanding and um, the parami are really, that list traditionally is the list of the qualities that sort of make the mind, put the mind and heart in that territory where we just have a lot of personal power, you could say, personal integrity and virtue and pliability, flexibility. So the mind is just in a good place in order to, to see more clearly and have, um, have insight, have wisdom arise. Um, but part of that wisdom and those conditions is the information, you know, the, the voice of another, the teachings that get these ideas and these perspectives going so that we actually have something to work with, to apply ourselves to. And the great thing about the paramis as a teaching um, list is that they're really applicable to daily life. We don't have to be sitting in meditation to be practicing patience or goodwill or truthfulness or de determination or resolution. Um, so they're really, and this is a really good reminder because we may think 
um, that the important part of practice is when we're sitting in meditation. And certainly, I recommend, and I think most meditation uh, teachers recommend <laughs> meditating, in particular, meditating every day for that, that consistency and that opportunity to put aside all the um, duties and responsibilities. But the reality is, for most of us, we're not going to be spending most of our life meditating. We're going to be in the world. We're going to be in relationships. We're going to be making a living. And in all those situations, we come up against the imperfections in our heart, the imperfections in the world. And this list is sort of a reminder that we can use all of the challenges of life, all the imperfections, the pleasantness, the unpleasantness, as opportunities to be developing the heart. So that's just a little overview of the parmi. And um, so today we'll be talking about patience, kanti. And uh, I'll read Ajahn Suchito's um, little description that he has for each of these, which is on those cards which you can find if you go to um, Amravati, which is the, um, the monastery with, where Ajahn Suchita lives. You can find these in, in also, or you can send me an email, or um, I might send it out to the email list again. And if you want to get on the email list, you can do that through the uh, calendar. There's a, a link there for the, in, in the description for this event. So Ajahn Suchito writes about patience, recognizing the value of tolerance and perseverance, I aspire to let go of getting my own way, cutting corners, and being narrow-minded. So there's a few different pieces here. Tolerance, perseverance, and what we're letting go of, which is impatience and rushing and sort of the, yeah, when we're impatient, we really kind of have our eyes on the prize and like, no, this needs to happen now. I need to get there. Um, this needs to unfold in a certain way. This person needs to behave in that way. So we're kind of, we're pretty sure that we, we know what needs to happen and we're, we're kind of have an A to B mentality. As quick as I can get from A to B, the better. And the trouble with that is that life doesn't always unfold on those terms. Um, and so if we're coming from that place of impatience, you know, I mean, it's so obvious the dysfunction, how it's not helpful. If you think of a classic example of impatience, like being stuck in a traffic jam, you know, we're stuck in a traffic jam and maybe it's true that we need to get where we're going, but being impatient probably doesn't help. You know, we're, we are behind the car in front of us. And so we can really see there how it's just adding a layer of tension that isn't helpful and may actually make us a worse driver. So I think the main uh, sort of contemplation on this first level of just thinking about what does this word patience mean? How can it be helpful? How can it shine a light on our habits, um, a fresh perspective? I think we, we sort of need to maybe um, reclaim it. Thanks, Charles Lee, for putting that in there. Yeah, that's the link to the um, teaching cards that I was mentioning, where, where he just has uh, one sentence for each of them, which I find a really great, pithy summary of what each of them mean. But yeah, with patience, I think we kind of need to reclaim it because um, I think often, the most commonly when we hear about patience, it's just, you know, like people thanking us for our patience, you know, while we're waiting on the telephone or standing in line. And so it's just sort of you know, this one of these values that we're supposed to have. But, you know, we could think about what is patience, what does it really do for us? How does it 
protect us? How does it support us? How does it strengthen our hearts? In the absence of patience, you know, what are we exposed to? What are we vulnerable to? And I think if we think about a life without patience, it's really a life where we're just kind of bouncing around reactively from one, one reaction to the next. Um, it's patience that allows us to stick with, you know, to make a commitment or to recognize something has value and to apply ourselves and to not just give up at the first sign of that it might take a while or first challenge that comes up. And I think it's also patience that allows our hearts to stay open with the complexity, the ambiguity, and just the plain difficulty of life. And a lot of uh, what Ajahn Suchitta talks about in his chapter is, is this patience with difficulty. Uh, I also read this described as patience under insult. So this is, this is real. This is where, where the rubber hits the road. It's easy to be patient when things are going well. Oh yeah, you know, it's a beautiful, it's been really beautiful here or really warm, which has been felt really good here in Minneapolis after winter. You know, it's easy to be patient if I'm just sitting out in the sun, you know, maybe with a nice fizzy drink and some chips. Yeah, I could stay there all day. But what about, you know, when there's some uncomfortable emotion in my heart or when somebody's doing something I don't like? Um, or when, yeah, your boss is asking you to get something done and you feel like you're really pressured. Or when things are really confusing or ambiguous, or, or you're just waiting, uh, waiting for some result, waiting to hear back from someone, some reply. You know, so, so much of the time, we're either sort of leaning forward, can't wait, you know, for the next thing or to get something over with, or we're kind of holding back, like, you know, well, this is really nice. Let me just, oh, you know, stay here in my warm, cozy bed. Um, so patience, I think, in its deeper meaning is really just kind of this aspect of growing up, you could say, which I think we're, we're always doing, you know, even those of us who are technically adults, <laughs> but just kind of maturing and making peace more and more with this truth of life that uh, in Buddhism sometimes is, is the teaching is of the eight worldly winds. Let me find that list, which maybe some of you have heard, which is just a nice summary of the fact that we, we can't control conditions, which is disturbing for the mind, for the mind that wants to control things. So the eight worldly winds, this is just a list of the inevitable ups and downs of life. So there's praise and blame. Everyone experiences praise and blame. Everyone experiences gain and loss. Everyone experiences fame and ignominy. Everyone experiences happiness and unhappiness. And we don't know, you know, when they will come, when the winds will change, just like the winds physical winds can change, you know, very quickly. It's the same. And part of us knows this and part of us understands that we're vulnerable in that way. And so patience has the wisdom that understands this and is basically willing, even though it's not our preference, but is willing to endure when things are unpleasant, willing to bear with it not to be crushed by it, not to throw a tantrum around it. You know, there is this kind of, you could say stoicism, but it's not, a, it's not an unfeeling sort of kind of pretend stoicism, but there's a, it's, a, it's a sort of peacefulness that comes from, um, yeah, from facing this and understanding that it's the way it is. 
And it's not just a philosophical stance like, yeah, life has ups and downs, so I should just you know, put up with it, which would sort of be like kind of a grim resignation and might, you know, there might still be a version in there. Not liking it. Well, I don't like it, but oh well, like what can I do? It's really coming from a place of wanting to be in alignment with how things are. Not wanting to live in delusion and fantasy. And some sense, too, a positive sense of inspiration or aspiration that it's possible for the heart to be transformed through that willingness to bear with things. That it's actually, in a way, an opportunity when our buttons get pushed and, you know, our anger shows up, our jealousy shows up, our impatience shows up. Because without, without these challenges, we wouldn't have the opportunity to see, see our conditioning. And we're never really free. We're never really going to be at peace as long as the mind is still clinging and holding on and resisting. Even when things are comfortable, it can be easier to miss this, you know, because, but then we don't see that we're attached. And the minute, you know, things are less pleasant, something doesn't go our way, and then we see how upset we can be. I mean, it's amazing just how the little inconveniences, the little, un, the things we don't plan for, right? Like you get a flat tire, or, you know, you spill food all over your shirt. Or, you know, even just these little things can really show the reactivity in the mind. The thing, and, and the question there is what assumptions and views is the mind holding on to? You know, when we're reactive, we get to see, oh, maybe the mind has been holding on to this view that things should go my way or things should be smooth or like this shouldn't happen right I shouldn't get sick people should treat me well so just kind of these assumptions that we might have are views just unexamined views And again, the point is, um, because, again, the question is always not like, what is the ultimate metaphysical truth? But the question is always, is this skillful? Is it skillful or unskillful? Is it supporting us in moving towards a more free, open, generous way of being? So yeah, I think this is an important point about the intention behind cultivating patience or any of the virtues, um, any of the parami, that really it's about freeing our hearts. Um, Because it's totally understandable that we want things to be pleasant and peaceful and for people to treat us well. Totally understandable, totally appropriate, totally makes sense to, you know, when given the choice, this is just what we do as human beings, as mammals, as beings interested in our, in our own welfare is to try to have pleasant experience, try to have good friends, safe place to live, good food to eat. So all of that is totally appropriate.
We're just not depending on it as something ultimately reliable. And when we do, and things change, then we get to see that. And we get to see maybe how we rebel, how we, how we, um, we really don't like it. I think a, a place that this is really poignant and um, where we can, we can learn about our, our assumptions or our preferences. And there's just a lot, you know, a lot comes up in this area of relationships, um, how other people treat us, how we want to be treated, how we want to be seen. You know, as mammals, we're just so intensely conditioned around um, belonging. And so it's, again, totally appropriate and really uh, part, I would say, of the Buddhist path is, and the Buddha talked about this, about cultivating wise friends and just the support that we have from associating with wise people, people who encourage us uh, to practice. But to take, you know, anything, even the most wholesome community or, you know, a teacher that we really respect or a partner or a good friend and to say, oh, now I've found something really reliable, a refuge that I can depend on forever. It's, I would say, going a step too far from even the Buddha. <laughs> Uh, I think someone, I don't know who said, the, Buddha, the Buddha's awakening solved his problem. Now we have to solve ours. So even the Buddha, all he could do was, was teach. And he taught for 45 years out of compassion, pointing the way out. But ultimately, our happiness and unhappiness depend on our actions, not others' wishes for us. And this is a traditional equanimity phrase. We can use it towards others too. Your happiness and unhappiness depend on your actions, not my wishes for you. And there's a coolness to that, but there's also the opportunity for our hearts to really be open. And I think this is a really profound exploration in terms of relationships, you know, what it actually means to love, you know, in a really open way without attachment. A lot of goodwill, a lot of care, anything that we could do, we would do, that would be supportive, and this deep understanding that we all have our own path, that people, that we, all of us, are a mix of skillful and unskillful intentions, that we're not, you know, set in stone, we're not one thing. And I think this helps, helps us not take the people in our life for granted and to not expect them to be perfect, not expect ourselves to be perfect, um, but really to see that we're all sort of in the same boat. We're interested in happiness, and yet we have these conditioned minds, conditioned by greed, aversion, and delusion, doing the best we can. And this perspective can really help us when there is conflict, when there is someone who's maybe acting unskillfully or we've acted unskillfully, uh, just this perspective that um, basically that supports forgiveness, supports uh, not um, crystallizing ourselves or others into I, I am a bad person, you are a bad person, or I'm a good person, you're a good person, and kind of fixating on that and then being disappointed when we don't meet our expectations or when other people don't meet our expectations. Again, it's not to say we shouldn't hold ourselves to a high standard. The Buddha really encouraged us, not because we want to have, you know, be full of ourselves, but because it supports our well-being. That's the whole point with these virtues, that the heart does have the capacity to hold these virtues in mind and to see that they're beneficial and have them become more and more um, a habit for us. But the Buddha was really clear about, about this in, in the realm of interpersonal relationships, just how ill will 
isn't skillful. He, he has this famous teaching, the simile of the saw. Even if bandits were to capture you and saw your limbs off with a two-handed saw, to give rise to a mind of ill will wouldn't be following his teaching. And I think it's purposefully provocative and um, a really high bar. And the Buddha was good at being dramatic sometimes or being provocative. But I, what I sense in that teaching is just this point that it's not helpful. Um, and it doesn't imply that we're, we don't recognize that obviously that's unskillful, violent behavior, that we wouldn't do what we could to protect ourselves. It's just this understanding that our hearts, uh, that taking that in, taking somebody else's ill will in and taking it personally and reacting to it is optional. And so this is a, a profound teaching, but that we can work with bit by bit with all the opportunities that arise in our life where we have ill will. We can just ask that question. We don't have to believe it. We can just ask the question, is this helpful? Is this helping anybody? And patience is what allows us to ask that and to stand with, to be with the impatience, the irritation, without condemning ourselves, without condemning the other person, just kind of like, yeah, it's like this sometimes. It's not easy being a human being. It's not easy being in relationship. We push each other's buttons. So I'll just um, make a few more comments and then I'll open it up. I'm curious to hear what other people have to say on this topic of patience. Um, but uh, just to come back to something I was saying at the beginning about the different stages. So there's the contemplating more on the conceptual level, what is patience? And then there's the... Um, bringing it into play, when we're impatient, irritated, can I bear with this? Can I make a little more space around this? Can I bring in a perspective, a bigger perspective? We're all doing the best we can. And so there's that sort of on that kind of purifying level. Um, the Buddha said that patience is the highest austerity, kind of this because it has, because it means bearing with, it means staying with what we might want to run from. But doing it because we're seeing that it's possible to stretch. Basically, it's learning that we can stretch. You know, how many times in our life have we thought, I can't do this, this is going to kill me, couldn't possibly. And we find when we check it out, no, actually, the heart maybe has more capacity than we think. So that's that kind of stretching aspect. And then the last, again, is that where we are recognizing, you know, like with patients, maybe what we would recognize is what I can learn through all the places of impatience in my life, all the places where things don't go my way, maybe that's actually more valuable than having things go my way. And so it's kind of this, this shift shift in perspective, and it takes us to this place of peace, where in a moment, the mind isn't creating tension through wanting things to be other than they are. And this could look like, you know, it could also, it doesn't just have to be passive, it could also be really wholeheartedly engaging with life, not holding back. So, um, but basically, it's this peace with the way things are. That's sort of the, um, the culmination of patience, where we're not just waiting until it passes, but we're sort of really surrendering in a way, submitting, or you could say giving ourselves to the moment, to what's here in a wholehearted way. Yeah, no part of the mind is sort of resisting. It's just... This is, this is the way it is now. Not denying that 
doesn't mean it's how I like it, but it is this way. And we show up to it fully, and there's these moments where there's peace. And in particular, with patience, it's a peace where we're not so identified with intention, with the part of the mind that intends to do, intends to make things happen, where we sort of feel like we, we have to do our life, where we have to be the person in control, which is really what impatience is about, sort of like, if I'm not holding everything together, things won't happen. And so patience is sort of, in moments, kind of the culmination of it is understanding that everything is happening on its own, even our own minds and intentions, the process of awakening, process of delusion, it's all happening on its own, and we can participate fully in that, but we don't have to own it, we don't have to identify with, with it, control it, and um, in moments then the mind can let go even of, yeah, identifying with intention, with doing, and that can be a profound moment of peace. So I'll leave my comments there and, and see what others may have to say, any questions you have about anything I've said, or just examples from your life of patients, teachers, um, times in your life where there was, uh, you had to practice patience, just there wasn't a choice. <laughs> These places in life where, um, yeah, things are challenging and there's not much we can do about it. And maybe actually we, we learn something about our capacity. We stretch a little bit. And two, we could share about what we've learned from impatience, times where we've been identified with impatience, maybe rushing, acting um, without, yeah, acting from that place and what we learned from that. Any thoughts from people? And just feel free to unmute and, and share. It'd be great to hear from a few people. And I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>